great. Thank you so much for coming today, guys. We are going to have so much fun. But before we begin, we are going to pray. So I want you all to fold your hands and close your eyes, and we are going to talk to God. Dear God, I thank you so much for today, and I thank you that all of these kids could come and join us. And I pray that we would just learn a lot about you today and that you would keep us safe. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so you can all stand up because we're going to start the club with a song. And this song is called Do What's Right. We've done it before. And it's just talking about doing what is right and what God wants us to do. So from the top, it's not hard to do what's right. It's not, it's not hard to do what's right when we are walking in the Father's light. We find these hands to give us power and might. It's not hard to do what's right. You've been living it up. All right, you guys are doing great. You've been living it up, thinking you're so smart, never stopping to see that you've got something wrong with your heart. But you don't have to lose hope when you're losing sight, because there's somebody who loves you. He wants to help you do right. It's not hard to do what's right when we are walking in the Father's light. We find He's there to give us power and might. It's not hard to do what's right. All right, on His word you can trust. See you together. On His word you can trust, it will never let you down. God has shown you His love, and there's enough to go around. And you don't have to give up, in the battle you fight, but there's no need to do wrong. No, when you can do right. It's not hard to do what's right When we are walking in the Father's light We find He's there to give us power and light It's not hard to do what's right All right, now we do the sprinkler, okay guys? So one arm behind the head, one arm out. Do, 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 do what's right do, 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 it is power and might. Do, 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 don't lose sight. Do, 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 do what's right. Great work, guys. You guys are doing great. It's not hard to do what's right. When we are walking in the Father's light, we find He's there to give us power and might. It's not Hard to do what's right. Whoa, to do what's right. Again. Oh, to do what's right. Awesome. Great, great singing, everyone. You can all sit down. is uh, hard. Uh, hey kids, it's, it's me, the contest guy. I, I forgot my prizes. Ah, that's better. So, remember how you do it. Watch the video, submit the quiz, either mail it in to the address below, or just submit it online. And when you do the first one, you're gonna get yourself a secret pin. And the only way you're gonna find out what it looks like is by doing the quiz. And, let's see, what else do they get? Oh, once you finish all five quizzes, uh, you'll get the, uh, oh, Hold on. Uh, 
You're gonna get a shady! Uh, I was hoping for a bit of reaction. You're gonna get a shady! Uh, that's better. Uh, and then, also for every quiz that you do, you're gonna get your name entered into a draw. <clears throat> well, you might ask, well, what could we win? Every week this summer, we're gonna be drawing two names, twin surprises. Some of the prizes are Adventures in Odyssey. Uh, let's see. Uh, we got this one, and we got this one, and we got this one, and oh, we even have some books for you readers out there. Uh, let's see. Jones and Parker uh, Case Files. Sounds like a thriller. And... Candid Conversations with Connie. These are some awesome books, so complete all those quizzes and you might be able to earn some adventures in Odyssey. Cut, cut, cut. All right, now today's Bible verse is from 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19 and 20. Now again, just to review, who can tell me what this part is called? Caitlin. It's called a restraint. Yes. And does anybody know what it helps you with? Marley. Yeah, it helps you to find verses in the Bible. Now, I'm going to read it from the Bible here. And it says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit. Okay, so what that's kind of talking about is how God, when he comes into us, we need to make sure that everything is right. Okay, now let's say someone important comes to your house. Does your house seem to be messy all the time? Do you want your house to be messy? No. No, are you sure? You just don't want to have all your socks lying around on the floor when your friends come over, when important people come? No, that's kind of how when God comes to live within us, we want to make sure that our hearts are clean. What do you think our hearts need to be clean of? Caitlin. Yes, you should be clean from sin. What are some examples of sin? Caleb? Yeah, Marley? Lying or stealing, those are some really good examples. So we have to try our best. Now, I know we're not perfect, and we can't always deal with all of our sin, but because God comes into our hearts, He helps us clean our hearts, right? So we have to ask God to help us with that. Okay, now we are going to say our verse together, so I want you all to stand up. Okay, and we are going to say the verse together, okay? Three, Two, one. First Corinthians six, verse nineteen and twenty. Do you not know that you, our body, is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit. Okay. Now we're gonna do one of my favorites. Stand on one foot, and we're going to put our right hand up in the air, and we're gonna put our left hand on our heads. You think we can say it? Yeah. Okay, three, two, one. One. First, First Corinthians, Corinthians 6, 6 verse 19 to 20. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit. Good job. Okay, now we are going to do some squats. Hands on your hips. And every time we say a verse or a word, we are going to go down and then up and then down and then up. You think we can do that? Okay, three, two, one. First Corinthians 6, verse 19 to 20. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit. Oh, so tired. Okay, 
we are going to do it in our old man voice. Like we're 350 years oh, old. Oh, oh, so, yeah, hunch over. Oh, get your canes out. Okay. Three, two, one. The first Corinthians yes. six, verse nineteen to, to twenty. 20. Do, Do you not, not know, know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Spirit. Therefore, Therefore glorify God, God in your body and in your, your spirit. Good job. Okay, we're going to say it once more all together. Okay, three, two, one. First Corinthians 6, verse 19 to 20. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit. Now it is time for another song. So remain standing. This song is a really good one. It's called Absolutely Nothing. And it's talking about God's love. What can take our God, God's love away? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. So, sing together. Nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing. Nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing. What can take your love away? Nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing. What can make us separate? Nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing. Death or in life. As deep or as high, there's one thing that stays the same. No power or king can do anything to take your love away. Nothing, nothing absolutely nothing, 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 absolutely nothing. What can take your love away? Nothing. Nothing, absolutely nothing. What can make us separate? Nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing. In death or in life, what's deep or what's high, there's one thing that stays the same. No power or king can do anything to take your Awesome, you guys did great. You can all sit down. All right, you guys. Now, does anybody remember where we left our story off yesterday? Caitlin. We left it off when she had really bad pains in her chest and stomach, and where something happened, like all of a sudden. You'll have to find out tomorrow. Yeah, exactly. So Corey was walking home and all of a sudden she had this really bad pain in her stomach and this really harsh pain in her chest and she wasn't able to breathe properly and she thought, oh, this is not good. So she started to run home. And as she started to run home, everything started getting black around her and she couldn't see anything. And then all of a sudden, Corey fell to the ground. Now, the next thing she knew, Corey was in bed when she woke up. And the doctors were around Corey and they said to Corey, Corey, you have tuberculosis. You need to stay in bed. Now, tuberculosis was a very dangerous disease and they had no cure for tuberculosis. So Corey had to stay in bed. Now, at first, Corey had lots of visitors. But after a while, because Corey stayed sick for such a long time, the visitors stopped coming and Corey started to get a little bit discouraged. She thought, well, am I supposed to be here all alone while I'm sick? I don't want to be sick anymore. I just want to be able to do what God wants me to do. But God helped Corey to realize that she needed to just rest and thank God for everything. So Corey, she decided that she would try her best not to be grumpy about it, even though it was really hard for her. Now, one morning she woke up and the pain in her stomach was getting even worse. So they called the doctors and the doctors rushed over to Corey and they said, Corey, we made a terrible mistake. 
you actually don't have tuberculosis. You have appendicitis. Her appendix was about to burst, which is where all of the bad toxins in your body are stored so that they don't harm your body. And her appendix was about to burst. So they rushed her to the hospital as quickly as, they, as possible and they had an operation on Corey. But after the operation, Corey felt much better. Now, Betsy, Corey's older sister, was teaching Sunday schools. And she came up to Corey and she said, Corey, why, why don't you come with me to Sunday school and you can teach the story? We're telling the story of the feeding of the 5,000. You know that story so well, I'm sure you'll do great. Corey thought about it for a moment. She said, I think I could do that. I think that's a great idea. So when Corey and Betsy got to the church, Corey stood in front of all of the kids and she started to get a little bit nervous and she forgot everything that she was supposed to teach the kids and her story ended up being five minutes long. And the kids looked at one another expecting more of the story, but Corey didn't have anything because she was so nervous. So Betsy came up to the rescue and told the story all over again so that the kids could learn a little bit more. Corey said, I am never doing that again on their way home. And Betsy looked at Corey and said, Corey, don't be so hard on yourself. It was your first time. You'll do great. Just give yourself some practice time. Corey decided that that was a good idea. So she called one of her friends who was a teacher at a Christian school. And she asked her friend if she could teach some Bible stories to some of the kids twice a week. Now, when Corey would do this, her friend taught her how to teach kids and the kids loved hearing Corey's Bible stories. They had so much fun. Now, that's not the only thing Corey decided to do. She also decided that she would start teaching kids who had trouble learning. They couldn't learn math problems very well and they didn't understand how to read. But because Corey was teaching them and God was working through Corey, they were able to understand that Jesus loved them very, very much. And lots of them came to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior and asked him to forgive them from their sins. Corey was so happy when all of these things happened, even though some of the people would look at Corey and say, why are you doing this, Corey? They're not able to learn. They're not able to read or do math or anything. But Corey decided to do the right thing and teach all of these kids about Jesus. Now, Corey, she was very busy, but she wanted to do as much as she could. She went up to her dad one day and said, Dad, I think I want to become a watchmaker just like you. Mr. Ten Boom turned to her and said, Corey, I hope you will become a better watchmaker than I am. Now, Corey realized that becoming a watchmaker is kind of difficult. See, the watch pieces, they come in all these tiny little parts and you have to have a very steady hand when you're fixing a watch. Every time her hand would start to shake, she would pray, Lord, please keep your hand on mine. And her hand would stop shaking. Now, a lot of things changed in the Ten Boom family. See, all of the three aunties, they had passed away and Corey's mom, because she had been so sick, she also passed away and went to live in heaven with Jesus. And Nolly and Willem, they had already moved out of the house and gotten married and had kids of their own. So now it was just Mr. Ten Boom, Corey, and Betsy living in the house. But not for long. See, Willem, he came back to the house one day and said, Dad, I want to be a missionary to Indonesia with a bunch of these other people. But we have a problem. See, there are no schools where we're headed. So would you be able to take Puck and Hardy and Hands, my children? Would, you, would they be able to stay here with you? Mr. Ten Boom thought about this for a moment and then agreed that his grandchildren could come and live with the Ten Boom family. Mr. Ten Boom loved having his grandchildren live with them. And that wasn't all. Also, some other girls came to live with the Ten Boom family. So they had a lot of children running around the house. Now, Mr. Ten Boom, every time visitors would come over, he would say how wonderful the children were and how they never fought. Well, Corey looked at her dad and said, Dad, love is blind. She had just sent Puck upstairs for saying, I hate Tiny. They had gotten into a big argument. See, Tiny, she had taken 
a cookie and Puck really, really wanted that cookie. And they started fighting over it and Tiny ended up putting it all in her mouth. And Puck thought, oh, that's not fair. And she started fighting against Tiny. And then Corey saw what was going on and she sent Puck and Tiny up to their rooms. Now, late that night, Corey went upstairs to talk to Puck. She said, Puck, you know, it's not good to hate people. God wants us to love everyone, even though sometimes we don't get along with other people. He still wants us to love every single person. Puck looked at Corey and said, but I can't love Tiny. It's too hard. Corey said to her, Puck, if you have the love of God in your heart, you can love Tiny with God's love. Puck decided that she would pray and ask God to help her love Tiny, even though it was really hard. Now, Puck and Tiny, after that, they became really good friends because Puck had prayed and asked God to help her. Now, the Ten Boom family also had a little bit of a problem. See, because they had so many kids living in their house and their parents couldn't pay anything to keep all of their kids alive, the Ten Boom family had to pay for everything, their clothes, their food, everything. And the Ten Boom family, they didn't have very much money. So they always had to pray and ask God to help them, to give them money and to support them through hard times. Now, like I said, Corey was very busy. One day, she decided that she was going to start a girls club in Harlem and it had music and gymnastics, and she would go there and teach Bible stories. Lots of girls came to know the Lord Jesus, and Corey was so happy. Also, they would go on camping trips, and the girls absolutely loved it. One day, Corey was almost asleep in one of the tents, and then she heard a noise. She thought, well, that's weird. She got out of the tent and she saw one of the girls that she had taken camping with her eating chocolate. She had eaten all of the chocolate that they had brought on the camping trip. And Corey looked at her and she went up to the girl and said, Annie, what, what are you doing? Why are you eating all of the chocolate? But Annie, she didn't answer. And Corey thought, well, this is weird. What? Annie, Annie, why are you eating all of the chocolate? and Annie still didn't answer. Now, Corey realized that Annie had been sleepwalking and that she had eaten all of the chocolate in her sleep. So Corey became quite concerned whenever they went on a camping trip. Now, also when they would go around the campfires, Corey would ask the girls some questions like, where do you live? And what are some of your favorite things to do? As the girls started to tell Corey where they lived, she realized that almost all of these girls were from the Smeadstrat. Do you remember when I was talking about the Smeadstrat where Corey, she would get so afraid because all of the people, they would fight there all the time. And Corey had prayed for all of the people that they would be saved. And here, Corey was talking with some of the girls in the Smeadstrat and how, how excited she was that she was able to share Jesus with them and that they would come and know that Jesus loved them so so very much. Now, a little while later, World War II broke out. And so they were no longer allowed to meet as a club anymore. And the girls became very, very sad. World War II was very terrible. One day, Mr. Ten Boom was walking down the street with Corey and he noticed a sign in the window and he started to cry. He said, Corey, this is just terrible. It's just awful. See, a man had come to power in World War II named Adolf Hitler, and the people who worked under him were called Nazis, and they didn't do very nice things. See, they took as many Jews as they could find, and they would often kill the Jews because he didn't like them very much. So in Harlem, they put up signs in the windows that said, no Jews allowed. They weren't allowed in stores. They weren't allowed to play in parks or playgrounds. And they weren't allowed on trains. Also, the Jews had to wear a yellow star on their shirts so that everyone could tell who was a Jew and who wasn't. 
Mr. Tenboom knew that this was not right. God loved everyone, including the Jews. Because God loved them, Mr. Tenboom decided that he would also love the Jews. Corey prayed one day. She said, Lord, if there is anything that I can do, please show me what I can do to help your people. One day, Corey came up with a brilliant idea. See, the Gestapo, the secret police in Harlem, were looking for Jews to take them away to prison camps. So Corey decided that she would hide some Jews in her house. She took six Jews and put them in her house. Now they had to be very quiet about this because if the Gestapo find out that the Ten Boom family was hiding Jews, it would be very, very bad and they'd take all of their Jews to prison. So they made some special things in the house to alert them if any of the Gestapo were coming into the house. One day, Betsy called, dinner is ready. Everyone rushed to the table, excited to eat, to tell their stories of what had happened that day, and to hear you see one of the Jews' funny jokes, which often caused the entire table to burst out laughing. Just as Corey was about to tell them of the watches she had sold that day, they heard the sound of the buzzer. That meant danger. Quick, everyone, clear the table and take everything that belongs to you, Corey said. We can't let the Gestapo find out that you are here. And tomorrow, we will find out what happens next. Hey, hi guys. Hi. I see that you're all awake. I want to do a very quick review of yesterday. I brought out a, and I asked you guys how to blow it up. And you guys gave me different instructions and I followed your instructions. Put it in your mouth, blow it. And finally we did get it blown up. But uh, what I wanted just a quick review is, this is a balloon and like I have a lot of these animal balloons and they're all the same, but yet with color, it makes them different. And when you ask Jesus to come into your heart, oh, this one's got a hole in it. <laughs> well, I guess I can't do it unless I have another balloon. Oh, I do. You ask Jesus to come into your heart and you keep following him, he has something special for your life. Because like I said yesterday, we're all all the same, but God has a different plan for every one of us. And God takes us through good times, hard times, and more important, the times that he shows his love towards us. And we keep following him. He has something special in store for us for our life. And he wants to make you very, very special. And more important, when you uh, go through the life experiences, he has a plan that only you can fulfill. And God wants the best for you and use you in a very special way. Yesterday I did a guitar, and this is a little doggy. And God wants you to know that each of us are special, but at the same time, he has a purpose for you. Here, I'll let you hold on to that. Okay. And today, I want to do something else with balloons. And I need a volunteer. Hands on your knees. Sit up straight. Hands up. Okay. Yeah, come on up, me. All right, glad to meet me. Okay, now I want you to stand right here, just like this, face them. And I'm gonna use him to illustrate something. I'm gonna read it out of the Bible quickly. This is in reference to the armor of God found in Ephesians 6, 10 to 18. I'm just gonna read uh, part of it. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, 
breastplate of righteousness in place and your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for the Lord's people. Now there's a, one here I wanted to stress because that's what I wanted to do today. Take the helmet of salvation. And I happen to have made a helmet. I call it the helmet of salvation. Are you ready? Uh, okay. What is it? <laughs> this is what I use for the helmet. And it, it's a very interesting one because it's got lots of colors. It's got pink, blue, red, white, and black. And there, we'll move that there. there that's, that's better. Okay, now you can face this way. And each of these colors have something special about them. Now, I have blue and pink. Anybody here know what blue and pink would stand for? Yes. Girl and boy. Girl and boy men and women. So that means salvation is going to be for everybody here. And the gospel says that all have sinned and fell short of the glory of God. And sin is anything that we say, think, or do that we know breaks God's laws. And I'm going to be illustrating something with that tomorrow, but or the next day. But today I wanted us to look at the dark color here that represents the sin in our lives. And as I said before, sin is anything you say, think, or do that you know displeases God. And the Bible says, for all have sinned. That's everyone here. But we do not want to stay in our sins. So God devised a plan so that our sins can be forgiven. And that is what the red color here stands for is the blood of Jesus. When they took Jesus to the cross, they put nails in his hands and in his feet, and he was stretched out, and there they hung him on the cross. And that was when he took the punishment for our sins. Because while he was on the cross and his hands stretched out and his blood was flowing, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's when he took on our sins, my sin and your sin, upon himself. Because it's the first time in all of eternity that he was separated from God the Father because God the Father could not uh, look upon Jesus as a son but as a sinner. And so on the cross, Jesus died. And to make sure that Jesus was dead, the Roman soldiers had a long spear and they took it and they shoved it through his side through his stomach and into his lungs and into his heart. And the Bible says that blood and water came out. So they made sure Jesus was dead. And then they took him off the cross and put him in a tomb. Now that's kind of like a grave, but it was in like a cave. And in front of the tomb, there was a big rock that they rolled in front and they sealed the rock with the Roman uh, signet. And anybody who broke that uh, seal they would be killed. So they wanted to make sure that the, the tomb was really to, uh, uh, sealed. And then, what happened three days later? Yes. He, um, rose again. he rose again. That means he came back to life again. And he's still alive today because 40 days later he went into heaven. Now we have a choice to make. You can choose to stay in your sins and forget about what Jesus did on the cross, or you can choose to have a clean heart. Now that's what this uh, light color here is. That represents a clean heart. That does not mean we're perfect, but it means we're forgiven. And we still sin, but when we do, we can go to God and he will free us or forgive us of that sin. And so, I need a volunteer. 
Now, I'm only gonna pick those that are sitting up straight. Hands on your knees. Hands up. Oh, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Uh, you were the last to put up your hand. Yeah, the one with beach. Uh, come on up. Come on up, you. Yeah. Oh, another me. You were me, now she's me too. That's pretty good. Uh, am I done? Nope. Okay, I got a gift for you. Did you want a gift from me? Um, pardon me? You want a gift from me? Uh, sure. Good. I was hoping you'd say that because I, I made this gift and I want to give it to you. You still want your gift? Yeah. You still want it? Yeah. Here. Yeah. There is a gift for you. Hold on to that. Wow. So there you go. That's a gift. Now, you could go sit down. Me too. Nope, not yet. You go sit down. See, she got a free gift. All she had to do was say, I want to come up. Oh, you better hold on to it. She, and then she came up and I asked her if she wanted a free gift. And she said yes. So she got the flowers which she gets to take home. Now, that's like salvation. Salvation is a gift that God offers everybody here. It's a free gift and you can accept it. And you can go from having a dark heart to believing what Jesus did on the cross with his death and resurrection. And when you believe that, you can have a clean heart which lets you into heaven. Therefore, your name is written into a book of life. And, and you have access to God uh, more clearly than if you never accepted him. So the helmet of salvation is very, very important and is part of God's armor for which he wants to protect us. All right, well now we are gonna be singing a song. This one is called Stop. Well, it's just called Stop. So we are gonna play that and uh, I want you all to stand up. Maybe do a couple stretches, and we're gonna sing this together, okay? All right, now, when we say stop, the rule is you have to do a big jump, okay? Stop! stop. And let me tell you what the Lord has done for me. Stop! And let me tell you what the Lord has done for me. He forgave my sin and He saved my soul. He cleansed my heart and He made me whole. Stop and let me tell you what the Lord has done for me. Stop and let me tell you what the Lord has done for me. Awesome. Okay, thanks so much, guys. You can sit down. And now, it is time for our Bible story. So, in our life, we will have friends. And, well, some friends are really good. And they can help us follow God. And sometimes there's friends, well, that sadly, they try and get us to do what's wrong. And try and get us to do things that we shouldn't do. Well, do you ever have friends that, you know, They'll maybe tell you to, to take a candy from a store or tell, tell you to disobey your parents. Or, or when you're older, they'll maybe tell you to drink or, or smoke or all these things. And maybe look at dirty pictures and all these things. And really, uh, these things aren't good for you. Like our verse says, our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is God. So our temple is where God is. And like Alicia was saying, if it's all dirty, you know, it's like our room. If we had a guest and our, our room was just so dirty and we just didn't care. You know, if we did all these things and we, we were just destroying our lives, that's what it would be like. And the Bible tells us that we need to remain pure. Now, can anyone tell me what the word pure means? What do you guys think? Layla? Clean. Exactly. It means clean. And God wants us to keep our lives clean, meaning without sin. Well, there were four young boys and in the Bible times. 
and these four boys, they needed to learn and they had to make a decision of keeping their lives pure. Well, before these young uh, boys were, you know, alive, way back when God gave Israel, or the Jews, a land, the land of Judah. And there was a little city or town called Bethlehem. And that's where some people lived. And God told the Israelites that they could have this land as long as they followed him and kept their lives pure. And, you know, that, that was great. And they lived quite some time uh, living for God. But unfortunately, it didn't last very long. You see, the people, they started to follow wicked kings and do some really evil things. And they started to turn away from God. Well, God, this wasn't good. You know, God had to punish uh, them for their sins because God is holy. And so he tried to warn them, though, because he didn't want to punish them. And so he sent a prophet. Now, can any of you guys tell me what a prophet is? Caitlin? Um, a prophet is someone who tells God's message. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly right. Um, someone who tells God's message and proclaims the truth. So God, he sent Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a prophet. And Jeremiah went to the people and told them, that if they did not turn away from their sin, then God would send a king to take over the land and he would maybe capture and take their things. Well, you think, do you think this was enough? Do you think they'd probably stop from their sin? Well, I'll tell you now, they didn't. They kept worshiping uh, different things in their lives. They, started, they continued to sin. And so God, he allowed a king to come. And this king was named Nebuchadnezzar. And oh man, he was an evil king. He came from Babylon and he came with all his soldiers and they came to capture the land. And they took all, you know, the gold from the Israelites' temple where they worshipped God. They took all that gold and put it in their places of worship so that they could worship their idols. Now, can anyone remember what an idol is? Uh, Caleb. wood or stone. Yeah, they'll worship false gods, you know, things that are not gods. And they can't answer our prayers or anything, but sometimes there's people that will worship idols. And, well, that's exactly what they use this gold for. And they also captured some young boys. You see, King Nebuchadnezzar, he wanted to have some people to work for him. And he thought uh, if he got some handsome, strong, healthy smart men. These could be good workers. And so there were four uh, in particular that he took. Sp four specific boys. And all well, these boys, they loved God and they feared him. And one was uh, Belteshazzar, and that, that, that was Daniel. And then there was Hananiah, and that's Shadrach. And then there was Mishael, which is uh, Meshach. And then there is uh, Azariah. And Azariah was Abednego. You see, the first names that I mentioned, like Hananiah and Belteshazzar, these were their Israelite names. And these names actually had meanings about God, like God is our judge and things like that. But when they got back to Babylon, where the king lived, this evil king wanted to change their names. And so that's what they changed them to. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these names actually represented the idols that the king worshipped. So it's almost like he was trying to get them to forget about God. But do you think that worked? No. No, you see, these boys, they loved God. And even if their names were different, and even though they were in a different town and city... They would not forget about God because they loved God. Well, they had a challenge coming before them. You see, the king, he wanted them to eat and drink the king's food and wine so that they would be healthy and strong and, and big. And, but you see, these boys, they knew God didn't want them to eat this food because, 
Well, one, um, God had told them that there were some foods they couldn't eat. And then two, you see the king would offer these, this food up to the idols and almost pray for the food uh, to the idols. And well, the boys knew this was not good and, and they couldn't eat of it. But, you know, there would have been a lot of pressure. You see, not only the king, but there were the other boys. You know, there were tons of boys around the table, not just the four of them. And I imagine they were maybe scared about, you know, if the boys would laugh at them. But they couldn't. You see, it says in the Bible that Daniel, he already made it up in his heart. He already decided beforehand that he would not um, go against God and make his life impure. Impure means, you know, unclean. He, he already made the decision. And so when he finally was there and had to make the decision, the decision was already made. You know, for an example, uh, in my life, I personally have just decided I'm never going to drink. So I've already made that decision. So whenever I'm faced with the choice, and if someone asks me, I already, I already know my decision. And so this is kind of what Daniel did. Daniel, he didn't have to think about it. He already knew he wasn't going to. So he still had to figure out how he could get away with not eating it. You see, the king, he, the king doesn't get pushed around. He was an evil king. He didn't have mercy. But Daniel, he decided that he would talk to a man who could help him. And this man, Ashpenaz, he was kind of the, the leader of these boys. And he would help them make sure they're healthy and strong and learning. And, well, he asked, you know, Daniel asked him, he said, da uh, could, could we, uh, I don't know if you know, but our God, he, he doesn't not want us to eat this food. Like, we can't eat of it. Um, is there any way we could eat our, our vegetables and our water? I promise you, we won't be weak. We, uh, we'll continue to grow. Well, the man, you know, he, he loved Daniel and, and the boys, but he just, he was scared of the king. And he said, if, if I were to do this for you, uh, the king, he'd probably cut off my head if he found out that you guys were getting weak. Uh, I just, I just can't risk it. I'm, I'm sorry, Daniel. I just can't. Well, Daniel, you know, he could have given up there and said, well, okay, I'll eat the food. But no. No, he knew he shouldn't, and so he continued to try and find a way. And so he went to the guard, and this guard was to protect and take care of the boys as well. And this guard, they asked him, they said, could we please uh, just eat our vegetables and water? Uh, we'll, we'll do a test, and, and we'll, we'll, see. Uh, we'll see if we're, you know, just as healthy. Uh, and, you know, after the 10 days, if we're not, well... Then, then you can decide what to do. But if we are, then we could continue to eat that way, couldn't we? And well, the guard, he, he maybe thought about it a long time because he knew the risks. You know, the king um, could have the guard killed for disobeying his orders. But the guard, he thought about it for a while and he said, hmm, all right, all right. That's what, yeah, we'll do a test. I mean, no hurt, right? Uh, okay. You guys can eat your veggies and your water or whatever your God wants you to eat. And after the 10 days, I'll examine you all. We'll, I'll line you guys up and we will decide if you guys are weaker than all the other ones. Because we all know veggies, they just don't cut it. Well, Daniel, he was so excited. He was thankful that they could now follow God without getting in trouble. Well, they did this test. <laughs> And after the 10 days, something really interesting happened. You see, the Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, they were actually stronger and more healthy than all the other guys that were eating the meat and the juice and, and the wine and all these things. And I wonder if it's just because Daniel and his friends honored God. And so God was on their side. And he, God probably helped them grow big and strong because they were obeying him. But that's not all. You see, after that, after like three years of this, they had to do some learning as well. And Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they would 
you study and they would make sure they're learning what they need to learn. And well, they would do tests here and there. But after the three years, the king, Nebuchadnezzar, came and he decided to do a test. And this test was to see who was the smartest. And the smartest ones would go on to serve the king. Well, he examined them and, and ran these tests, asking them th things. And guess what? The Bible says that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, all four of them, were ten times smarter than all the rest of the boys. <laughs> I mean, that's crazy. But really, it's not. Because when we keep our lives pure from dirty pictures, dirty songs, uh, dirty movies, uh, you know, and just things we eat or drink, you see, God can honor that. Because, you know, God lives inside of us and He wants us to keep our lives pure, meaning clean. And you know what? We need to make sure we honor God in keeping our lives pure. And when we see those things, we need to turn away and make sure we don't see those bad, bad pictures. Or when we, or our friends want us to do something, we need to politely tell them no. No, I cannot do that. And we need to make sure we start standing up for God and keeping our lives pure, just like Daniel and his friends. So that's our Bible story today. Thank you all for listening so well. Hey guys, so this whole week we've been learning about pleasing God and doing what's right. But you see, in order to please God, we need to become a part of his family. We need to be a child of God. Well, how do we do that? Well, that's by trusting in Jesus. And that's the reason I have this book. You see, this book shows us at how we can become a child of God, how we can trust in Jesus. So this book, it's a pretty special book. You see, it doesn't have any words. I'm gonna flip through the pages here and you can see there's no words. But that doesn't mean it doesn't have a very special story. Well, I'm gonna tell you the story. Starting at this black page here, this page represents sin. And you see, sin is anything that we do, say, or think that goes against God's law or something that's wrong. You see, that'd be lying, cheating, having a bad thought. All those things are sin. And the Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that's to say that we're not good enough to go to heaven. You know, when you're a child of God, you get to go to heaven. But we're not good enough. You may say, well, that doesn't add up. How do we become a child of God then? Well, that's what the next page says. You see, even though we've all sinned, the Bible says if, if someone says they haven't sinned, they are a liar. Because everyone has sinned. We've all messed up. And that's why this page is so amazing. You see, the verse, this, this one represents Jesus' blood. You see, in the Bible, it says in Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, Jesus, he had to pay the wage. And the wage means cost. Jesus didn't want us to pay the cost. He didn't want us to have to die. And so Jesus, he died on the cross for our sins so that we wouldn't have to. And... The free gift of God is eternal life. It's free. All we have to do is accept it. And if we confess Him, and if we trust in Him, He'll save us. If we confess from our sins. And that's what this next page is about. This page is white. You see, there's, there's nothing wrong with it. It's, it's pure. It's clean. And the Bible says that when we trust in Jesus, our hearts will be whiter than snow. It'll be wiped clean because God cleanse our hearts. Just like our song said. You see, in Romans 10, 9, it says, if we confess with our, your mouth that the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's all we have to do. It's not about doing what, you know, doing all good things and that's the way we get to heaven. Those things are great to do and we should do them because we want to please God, but that's not how we go to heaven going to heaven, we trust in Jesus and believe that he died for our sins and that he rose again. And if we do that, we'll be saved and our hearts will be whiter than snow. 
And then we'll be able to live in heaven forever with him. You see, heaven is where God lives and Jesus. You see, once Jesus rose again, he went up to live with God in heaven and he's preparing a place for us. It says in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God created heaven and he wants you to live, live there with him. And if you trust in Jesus and ask him to forgive you for your sins, you can. It's not about, you know, being perfect because none of us are. It's only by trusting Jesus because he's our only hope. And, you know, God loves us so much. It says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You see, Jesus is God's son. And God loved you so much that he gave his only son. It was his only son and he gave him to die on the cross for you so that you can be saved. And if you trust in Jesus, you will go to heaven and live with him forever. And so maybe you're thinking, yeah, I, I want to do this. I want to trust in Jesus. Well, there's a prayer that you can pray with me and I'll show you how to pray. Ah, Because some of you may not know what to say and that's okay. It's not about the words. It's just about the heart and what you are asking Jesus to do. And so I'm going to ask you to fold your hands Bow your head, close your eyes. And if you're wanting to ask Jesus to be your savior, repeat after me and let's pray to God. Dear Jesus, thank you that you love me. Thank you that you died on the cross for my sins. I pray that you will forgive me for my sins. I am sorry. Please save me from my sin and help me to live for you and tell others about you. Thank you again for everything you've done. In your name, amen. Awesome, that's great. You see, if you prayed that prayer and, and you meant it, if you trust in Jesus, <laughs> you're a Christian now. You see, you're a part of God's family and it is such a good, um, a good thing to do. And when we're part of God's family, God gives us a desire to please him and do what's right. And so, there's another way how we can please God, and that's by growing in our faith. You see, in the Bible, it says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, it says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, does that mean we have to grow really tall? <laughs> no. No, that's not what that's saying. You see, that's what this green page is about. When something grows, it's becoming stronger. And you see, there's a certain way we can grow. And the best way I can tell you guys and teach you guys is by the word grow. There's four letters in that. You see, G stands for going to church. Why would we go to church? <laughs> well, you see, church is where we can learn about God and how much he loves us and also about the Bible and the Bible stories. But it's also where we can have fellowship with people who also trust in Jesus. And we can build friendships and it's a great place to go because uh, you will become stronger in your faith in, and in your trust with God. And then the next one is R. And that stands for reading your Bible. And that's a great way to, to have a personal relationship with God. And I encourage you guys to read it every day not because you have to, but so that you can learn about God. And the next one is O. Um, it's great to read your Bible, but ultimately you need to obey the Bible. Because once you're a Christian, God gives us the desire to please him. And we ought to, we need to. And if we trust in him, he'll help us to do that. And we won't be on our own and we need to obey the Bible. And then the last one is the, word, is the letter W. And that stands for witnessing to others. And now, witness is kind of a hard word, but basically what that means is to show others. Show others what Jesus has done for you. And if we show them, maybe they'll want to ask Jesus to be their savior. And we can tell them about how God has changed your life and forgiven you for your sins and how Jesus loves them too. You see, Jesus loves everyone. And, you know, because I love you guys, 
I didn't keep this good news to myself. I shared it to you guys. And so go share it to others. Thanks guys. All right, so today we are going to be making wacky sacks. Now, some of the things you're going to need are a balloon. You'll probably want a spoon as well, a bowl, a funnel, and some flour. You might want to get your parents to help you because the flour can be a little bit messy, but it's a lot of fun. So what we're going to do is we're going to pour the flour into the bowl. Here we go. And then you're going to take your funnel and put it inside the balloon. Okay, now you're going to take your spoon and you're going to start filling your balloon with flour. And you'll want to do this until your balloon is pretty full. You want to feel You'll like feel it inside, but make sure that you keep filling it even if you think you can't get any flour inside of it because it'll just be 10 times better if you fill it as far as it can go. And if you're having trouble getting the flour down, you can tap the funnel a little bit and it'll usually go down pretty well. Or you can take the bottom and just stretch it and the flour should go down. You can make it as big as you want. All right, I think I've made it how big I want it. So I'm just going to put the funnel and the balloon over the bowl so I don't make a mess. And I'm just going to take the balloon off of the funnel. And then I'm going to tie a knot just about here where the flower is. If you don't know how to tie a knot, I know tying knots with a balloon can be kind of tricky. So you might want to get your parents to help you do that. And then once you've finished tying your knot, of a fun little wacky sack. You can squish it, you can throw it around, and they're just super fun to play with. They're super squishy and soft too. Love them. I hope you guys enjoyed making that craft and we'll see you tomorrow. All right, you guys, I hope you had a lot of fun today. Now, we were talking a little bit about the wordless book today, and I'm gonna show you mine here, but we are going to play a little bit of a game with this wordless book, okay? So when I tell you to turn to a color, I'm gonna to turn to this color, I need you to find something that is black, either in your house or just around the yard or whatever. Yes, Caleb? No, I need you to find an object that is black. So I'm going to give you one minute to find something that is black. Yes, Lydia? Uh, no, you have to go find an object somewhere around the yard or in the house. Yeah. Marley? Yeah. Socks. <laughs> well, if you can take them off of him, I guess you can take one. <laughs> okay, but I'm gonna give you 60 seconds to go find something that is black. Okay, three, two, one, go.
I need you to find something that is red. Three, two, one, go. Good job. Now I need you to go find me something that is white. Quick, run. Okay, now can you guess what the next color is? Blue. It's yellow. Go find it. All right, our last color is green. Go find it, quickly. All right, thank you guys so much for coming today. Make sure you come again tomorrow. We're going to have even more fun tomorrow and make sure you try and bring your friends because I'm sure they will enjoy it so much as well. Okay, you guys have a good day and we'll see you tomorrow.